All right, well, good morning, everybody. Once again, welcome to Cosmic Coffee. I'm cup number 17 now, so we've been doing this for about four months. Um, Welcome to this week's episode. This is the second of uh, two that we're doing uh, centered on Pluto because this is uh, right around the fifth anniversary of the New Horizons flyby of Pluto. I'm joined uh, this morning uh, by our astronomer, Dr. Will Grundy, who is a member of the New Horizons uh, mission uh, and the team lead for the surface composition uh, team with New Horizons. Um, so first of all, a few little uh, intro and administrative things. As you know, we give a, a shout out to one of our local businesses here to, to encourage you to go have a little coffee and support them as they sort of deal with the economic impacts of the whole crisis. Today, that's Tourist Home down on uh, south, south San Francisco, south of the tracks. Apparently, our marketing and building and grounds teams uh, basically subsist on their breakfast burritos, and they heartily recommend those along with a nice... Uh, uh, dark blend, perhaps to wash it down. So support our local businesses as we're dealing with this uh, economic crisis. Now, if you want, you can go to last week's episode of Cosmic Coffee on our YouTube channel, and you'll hear a conversation between um, me and Dr. Gerard Van Bell, who was at the 2006 conference in Prague, uh, where Pluto was, quote, demoted from planethood. And we had a long conversation about what constitutes a good definition of planet and why we why we place importance on classifying things and, and what we understand when we do that. So go, go back and look at that later. Uh, for now, we're, we're now gonna move ahead since this past Tuesday was the fifth anniversary of the flyby. Um, we're gonna just have Will, who was deeply involved with all of that, tell us basically about the trip. If you wanna learn about the entire mission, I heartily recommend the excellent book, uh, Chasing New Horizons by Alan Stern and David Grinspoon. They tell the whole story, which goes all the way back to 1989, when this was kind of a twinkle in everybody's eyes. And um, you read that book, and it's, it, it becomes apparent you know, just the number of hurdles that, that had to happen for, for that incredible, iconic image of Pluto to appear on all the papers around the world. It's just a magnificent achievement. Today, we're going to focus on the trip. And so basically starting at launch, which then consumed, I think, nine years of, of Will's life getting across the, the solar system. So thanks very much for joining us today, um, Will. And we'll, let's just take it from the start and, and hear about all the, the different parts of this rather amazing journey. So let's start with the, your recollections of the launch and, and then just getting three billion miles across the solar system out to Pluto. Right. Uh, so the launch was in January of 2006. And uh, I have to say my first reaction on seeing it go up was, ha, now there, it's going to be a lot harder to cancel us um, because we'd been facing risks of cancellation and, uh, well, real, real cancellations uh, multiple times. Um, Ted Dunham, one of our astronomers, uh, took me aside during one of those and said, eh, don't worry, you're not a real mission until you've been canceled at least twice. <laughs> And he would know. So, uh, so once you're off the launch pad, it's much harder to cancel you. Um, of course, nine-year trip is a long trip, and the only real way to make that as short as possible is to go as fast as possible. And the way you do that is make the spacecraft as small and light as possible, and put it on the biggest rockets you can afford. And so when it took off, it was none of this lumbering slowly off the launch pad like the space shuttles or the Apollos, uh, really massive um, spacecraft. It was just like poosh, like a bottle rocket. It just really took off. It was pretty amazing. Um, but then, uh, like Jeff says, um, nine years of are you there yet? But um, you can't spend money at the rate that you would spend to be fully engaged uh, you know, with a team of many, many, many people. Um, so we called the profile the bathtub, which is high on the rim and then low in the middle and then high again when we get to Pluto. And all of us were in at the 5, 10, 15% level during that long bathtub period. Um, you don't want to totally disengage because you don't want to lose the knowledge, uh, but you can't be spending money full time on it either. So, uh, so we were actually at a pretty low level during that long trip. Mm -hmm. But I mean, you had there, there were constant readjustments because as we went, of course, you have to plan the encounter, and yeah. we kept discovering all these new moons, which 
as I understand, required you basically had to replan all the sequences to try to catch them all. Um, not re not really. Um, so so the way it worked was uh, we had the Jupiter flyby only 13 months after launch, and so it was really a bit of a frantic scramble to plan the Jupiter encounter, and we took as many observations, if not more, at Jupiter as we did uh, in the Pluto system. And it was, of course, we were closer to the sun, so it was easier to get them home, all the, the voluminous data that we took. Um, but then we decided that, okay, we've learned how to work as a team. We've learned how to operate the spacecraft. We've learned a lot of lessons about what not to do. Um, let's plan the Pluto encounter while this is all fresh in our minds. And so we spent basically the next two years planning the Pluto encounter. And um, Nix and Hydra had been discovered right before we launched. Mm -hmm. So we fit them into the sequence. And we were kind of scratching our heads going, you know, it's possible that other moons will be discovered. So we put in a couple of TBD observations. That's what they were right. called, TBD. Um, and so that's what we used on the other two moons that were discovered later. Uh, so we didn't actually have to replan anything. Mm -hmm. what, what did get replanned was that we got to thinking about those moons as a possible hazard because dust that gets blasted off the surface of one of those moons by an impact, uh, you know, if it was just the moon all by itself, a small body with an escape velocity of centimeters per second, that dust would leave. But they're in orbit around a much more massive planetary sized body, so the dust is going to stick around. And you crash into a small dust particle when you're moving. Um, 36,000 miles per hour, that could be catastrophic. So, so we planned um, some alternative trajectories that were further away. We planned some trajectories that we really didn't want to do that basically put the high gain antenna forward as a shield, which meant that the cameras were not pointing in useful directions all of the time, but it meant that the spacecraft would be quite resilient. Um, and then all of those sequences we're in the can, and then we could make the decision shortly before the flyby which of those we would actually fly based on what the spacecraft actually saw with its own cameras. Right. And so as, as you were closing in, that, that decision was made not too long, as I recall, before the, the closest approach. And it was just based on not seeing anything that you thought looked that's particularly right. Right. That's right. Um, it, uh, as you know, Pluto was in the heart of Sagittarius in the, in the Milky Way. Um, at the time. So the backdrop was very cluttered, but we were taking lots and lots and lots of images of that field as we got closer and closer to it. And once you've taken a zillion images of the same star field, you can build up a super image that you can subtract off of your images. And that would have worked fine, except for the fact that, as Jeff could tell you, every star is a variable star at some yeah. level. And so they don't all subtract off quite as well as you would like. Right. <laughs> But we were looking for things like rings or dust structures, and we we got down to pretty good sensitivity limits by the time we had to make that call. And of course, it was a great relief to to just go with the original trajectory that was really very fine tuned and optimized from many years of work. Right. So yeah, the the trajectory that would maximize basically the scientific return of the flyby. Your, That's your, right. Your, yeah. All right. So. Um, so you fly for, for nine years, and uh, then Alan describes very well in, in his book this rather heart-stopping episode that's one of these things that happens to missions. I, was, was that actually on July 4th that everything went south? or uh, I believe. I thought it was 10 days ahead. That's right. And um, yeah, so what happened was the spacecraft saved itself, and we lost contact, or we didn't hear from it when we expected to hear from it. Um, the engineers at APL really did heroic efforts to figure out what had happened. And it turns out that what had happened was that the computer was overtaxed. It was trying to compress images at the same time as we were trying to upload the next set of commands for it. And that was too much at once. And of course, it's not like we hadn't rehearsed any all of this ahead of time. But when we ran the rehearsal, we didn't have images of Pluto in, in the memory trying to be compressed. And those images were so information rich that they were a lot more expensive to compress. And the computer was working a lot harder than it had when we when we practiced that. I, I mercifully missed out on uh, losing sleep. I was, I was flying in on a red eye that night. And I was thinking, ah, maybe I should open my laptop and check my email. <laughs> no, nah, no, nah, I'll sleep better if I don't check my email. <laughs> I got on the plane. I slept on the plane. And I arrived at, you know, dawn in Maryland, well-rested, which would not have been the case if I had read my email. 
<laughs> Definitely not. So, so um, as I recall from Alan's books, essentially you had to just reset and re-upload the whole sequence to it, or or what was actually the yeah? Thing? So the sequences are are broken into blocks, and um, and they're designed so that if you if something gets interrupted, it'll it'll pick up where it should be, and uh, mm. so. It, it was a fairly resilient system. Um, the main thing was just figuring out what had gone wrong in the first place. And I remember some of the engineers saying, well, if it's this, then we'll hear from the spacecraft at this time. If it's that, we won't hear from the spacecraft until this other time, and we'll need to do this to recover. And okay. they worked it all out with the long light time delays round trip to the spacecraft and said, okay, you guys go to sleep now. You guys wake up at four in the morning and, and be ready to do this in case we're on this trajectory. You guys wake up at, or show up at 10 in the morning and you're doing this if, you know, and they, they choreographed the whole thing out and it, it was quite impressive. Um, yeah, but, and, and actually a question just came in and I was just going to uh, uh, ask you that, the, the how long is the light delay? It was like, it was four and a half hours ish or something, four ish. Yeah, that's one way. Um, one so way. Like, right. Yeah. So, so if if you hear from the spacecraft and it allows you to diagnose a problem, and you want to give yourself maybe at least a half an hour to think it through, and then you could transmit, probably a little longer than that. Uh, then you transmit the response. You know, you you haven't really saved the day until ten, twelve hours later. And mm -hmm. of course, this the spacecraft is continuing out from the sun after Pluto. So now we're five years post flyby and now the round trip light time, boy, I don't even know what it is. It must be uh, six hours or something at this point. Yeah, it must be getting close to six. And uh, that, I mean, that must've just been teeth grinding moments, just having to wait four and a half hours before you can even get any feedback on, on whether you- Right, right. Well, there's plenty of time to think about, okay, how, how should I use my time? Maybe I should just go to sleep now because there's absolutely nothing I can do and I won't get any sleep later. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so well, obviously we got it. We got it fixed up without too much scientific loss. So let's go ahead and and check out some of the the goods from the flyby itself of, of the whole system. I, I know you said you had some some images to throw up. Yeah, let me um, let me share my uh, screen here. Um, okay, so so this image that you see now uh, is a black and white image that was taken shortly after the closest approach. So we're now looking back at the dark side of Pluto. And uh, when this came in, it was a couple of months later, uh, it takes time to transmit everything home. It came in early on a Sunday morning and you should have seen the email traffic. Everybody was like, wow. Uh, and so we called this the wow image for a while just because that was what it, how everybody reacted. Um, what I'm gonna do is zoom in a little bit because what you can't see at zoom resolution or uh, you know, on YouTube is is how wide this image is. It's about five thousand pixels wide, and even longer in this direction. So you can see the the glow of the haze all the way around. And I'm going to zoom in on the on the lit crescent, so you can just see some of the detail. Mm -hmm. You can see all these layers of haze in the atmosphere. You can see uh, mountainous regions that are really very rugged in the shadows of the mountains. You can see shadows cast by the mountains. Mm -hmm. um, you see this large smooth area near the middle of the screen, that's the Sputnik Planitia uh, glacier. That's this big convecting region of, of uh, kind of a new kind of glacier where it's, it's sort of slowly simmering like a pot of oatmeal. It takes you know, 100,000 years or a million years to overturn, but that's rapid enough overturn that you don't see any craters there. Right. Uh, they just get erased. Um, and you see glaciers uh, sort of in the, the right mm -hmm. third of the screen draining down from highlands into into that smooth area. Um, and you can go all the way around the limb and you can see the limb of the planet even on the night side silhouetted against the haze. And you can see it when you get all the way down to the bottom, look how rugged it gets. And so that's the hemisphere we didn't get a great view of because it's just a flyby. You get one hemisphere well and the other hemisphere not so well. But you can see that it's really very rugged terrain on that side too. So there's interesting stuff to be seen over there too. Yep. And those those mountains near the Panicia, what what what's the elevation on those? As I recall, it was like it's serious, ten or eleven thousand feet. Um, is that somewhere else? I think 
min to max, I think it's uh, over 10 kilometers. Okay. Um, so multiply by, th so that would be like 30,000 feet. Yeah, okay. So Everest-like. Yes, yes. And, and this one near the center of the screen is an unusual one, the one with the deep hole in the middle of it. Um, unfortunately, you can't see my mouse, but it's near the center of the screen there. Yep. That one's thought to be volcanic in nature, uh, uh, some kind of eruption from that central pit. We don't really understand the details, but uh, a very unusual shape for uh, the outer solar system where we don't really, haven't really seen it, any analog like that on other yep. bodies. Yeah, yeah, it's just beautiful. Um, question on the feed, um, why was the mission designed as a flyby rather than an orbiting mission? Yeah, I wish it was an orbiter, that would have been fun. Um, but basically it took us this 200 foot tall expensive rocket to get going fast enough to get out to Pluto in nine years. And it would have taken a equivalently large rocket to slow us back down again at the other end. And, uh, and then of course the launch rocket would have had to get that much bigger again. Um, so it really just wouldn't have been feasible. Um, right. There are technologies that could do it, um, but not on the budget that we had. Right, right. Yeah, and that's when you were mentioning the launch, I mean, it, you, you can find that easily enough the, online. And basically that, that whole enormous fairing is, is essentially empty, right? And you've got what, five boosters on it. So the amount of firepower you had to just fling that thing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is the sort of rocket that would put a school bus size thing up into uh, you know geocentric orbit, which is a pretty high orbit. Um, and we're putting something that's the size of a piano on it. Right, um, right up in the tip, yep. <laughs> Alan describes it as a hood ornament. You know, basically the spacecraft this is a tiny little thing in this giant rocket. Um, let's see. Uh, Here's, uh, here's the largest moon, Sharon, the, the best uh, resolution color image of the whole thing. And uh, again, you can see that there's all kinds of geology going on. Mm. Um, you know, the Southern hemisphere looks smoother. The Northern hemisphere looks much more rugged. Um, the red polar cap, which is very distinctive. Um, all kinds of weird uh, mountains with moats in them, um, like this thing, or moats around them. Mm -hmm. Um, strange wrinkles, and actually, let me see if this, the black and white one might be slightly higher resolution. Yeah, let's try that. <clears throat> yeah, there's a good view of that mountain with a moat around it, and uh, mm -hmm. all kinds of uh, you know these little these little pits here, and the little cluster of hills uh, sort of near the center of the screen. Um, those basically say that some other processes were happening even after this major resurfacing went on. And that's all still being wildly speculated about and people are writing papers about. Um, um, one thing that I, I, I should mention um, here, this uh, textbook uh, was the definitive Pluto textbook. It came out in 1997 and um, on the back cover, it gave our best view of the Pluto system, which you can maybe see there um, from Hubble Space Telescope at the time, where it was basically two little dots, barely resolved. Um, so the new textbook is gonna be coming out uh, at the end of this year with the, the vast uh, collection of knowledge that we've gained from the New Horizons mission. Um, and uh, you can pre-order now probably on Amazon. I'm not totally sure about that, but uh, mm -hmm. it's from the University of Arizona Press and everybody's been working their tails off writing chapters for the book. So right. we, the phrase is we wrote the textbook, but or we rewrote the textbooks. Um, you yeah, literally that, did. Um, that work was happening for the last year or so. So a question on the feed is how fast you were going um, and of course it varied over the course of the mission after the Jupiter slingshot, but you were still really trucking when you got to Pluto. Yeah, so I think it was about, unfortunately I know everything in metric units. Um, it was about, I think 16 kilometers per second after we got the Jupiter gravity assist. And we had slowed down to sort of like 14 kilometers a second by the time we got to Pluto. And that was just from climbing out of the sun's gravity well. Right. But even Jupiter is pretty far outside the sun's gravity well. So we didn't lose that much. And, um, 
that's basically way over escape velocity from the sun. So we're out of the solar system. Oh yeah. And that 14 kilometers a second is basically our our trajectory relative to the sun from here on out. It's it's not fast enough that it makes a huge difference on galactic scales. Um, so we're basically in in an orbit around the galaxy, kind of like the sun is in orbit around the galaxy, but um, right. But we're recall, not tied to the sun. When we were doing flyby week here, the figure we were using was in somewhere in the low thirty thousands of miles per hour. To right, I think it worked out to like thirty six thousand miles an hour or something. Right, which right. I don't know if that's more intuitive to people. It's not like most of us get a chance to go that fast either. Very rarely. I, I, I never have personally. Um, so question on the feed um, was uh, just what you consider to have been some of the most unexpected and surprising features um, that you discovered. Yeah, um, well, that red pole on, on Sharon was was uh, was a surprise. And and we figured out what was going on actually well ahead of the flyby. Um, at least we had a hypothesis that so far still seems to be the best answer for it. And um, this was weeks ahead of time when we were just getting fuzzy images and uh, Todd Lauer, who uh, worked on the, the, I don't know if you remember back when Hubble was first launched, the mirror had the wrong prescription. And so the images were kind of fuzzy and people got really, really good at deconvolving those images to extract the best, uh, sharpen them as best as could be done. And so he was sharpening the images that we were getting as the spacecraft was very distant. And we kept seeing this darkish spot on the, the pole of Sharon and it was bugging us and we were scratching our heads over it. You know, is there some lava flow up there? Why would it be at the pole? Um, and the, uh, the aha moment came when it was at the end of a long, long day of meetings and uh, Randy Gladstone and I, he's the head of the atmosphere uh, science theme team were talking about the pole and he he was remarking that the pole is the warmest place on Sharon because it's in continuous sunlight. And, you know, could that extra heat do anything? And, but we couldn't think of any material that would be mobilized at the balmy uh, 60 <laughs> degrees above absolute zero that it might reach at the pole there. And so the aha moment was when we realized that the opposite pole, the winter pole was also getting extreme seasons and was so cold that the gas that's escaping from Pluto's atmosphere and streaming past Sharon would get temporarily trapped there. And then it could get involved in chemistry and make this reddish coloration. And so we predicted based on black and white images that it would be red and there would be one on each pole. Um, it took a long time to confirm both of those things, but uh, yeah. but that seems to be the the answer. So that's one, one good surprise. Um, uh, but there was just so many. I, I mean, um, you know, just the the diversity of of terrains. Let me let me go back to uh, um, Pluto here. Sorry, I'm flipping through these in a clumsy order. Um, uh, you know, so so this large simmering uh, glacier that's like you know churning oatmeal. Um, you know these complicated mountain ranges, um, craters, some of which that look like they've been filled in with stuff, mm -hmm. um, just massive cracks. And it's like everything a planetary scientist could could like, Pluto had it. Um, you know, those haze layers, the very complicated atmospheric dynamics, um, scarps and craters. And uh, um, I'll show you a weird one over here. Um, uh, here's like a dendritic drainage pattern. So, you know, how does that happen? Um, you know, we see those sorts of things on Mars and on Titan and on Earth where there's liquids that flow across the surface. Um, so is this something that happened below a glacier or is this some liquid that happened in uh, um, exotic climate conditions that we don't know about or some liquid that we don't know of yet? Um, all of these little fields of pits that are clearly not impact craters, you know, something erupting out from below the surface or draining into the surface. Mm -hmm. uh, here's here's a, a cool set of fractures that are all sort of converging on on more or less the center of the screen. Um, you know, that usually happens if there's something that drained out of the subsurface and the, the landscape collapsed or, or it bulged up 
because like a lacolith was injected into the subsurface, but this thing is huge. That's, you know, hundreds of kilometers. Um, this kind of texture down here sort of okay. looks like snake scales or whatever. Uh, you know, when we first saw that, it was like, okay, fine. Pluto can do that too. <laughs> what is that? <laughs> you know, so as a planetary scientist, we were like, you know, pigs in mud. We were just wallowing in such amazing uh, riches. Uh, it's just yeah, so many things to to try to figure out. I know it was it was you know truly thrilling. You know, not being sure. You know, you're just going to see some you know Mercury-like body with lots more craters, and instead we get this incredible diversity. Um, there there are some questions that have come in that are okay. I think somewhat related to what you've been talking about. First, um, what's the the thinking or the confidence level on a subsurface ocean of liquid water at this point on Pluto? So there are a bunch of indirect lines of evidence for it. Um, one of the better ones maybe is that uh, is when you look at these fractures, these are these are classic grabens where the land has pulled apart. So basically, Pluto has expanded. Um, and the most obvious reason for it to expand is liquid on the inside freezing because when ice forms, it's bigger, it's, it's lower density than the the water. and so it has to it takes up more space. And so the fact that you see these graben quite widespread and that they're recent, so you, what you don't see is impact craters cutting these, these graben. What you see is the graben cutting impact craters. So these are recent, geologically speaking. Ah, and right. so that suggests that the ocean is either just froze, which would put us at an unusual time, or it's still continuing to slowly freeze. Um, and that's probably driving a lot of the geology. Um, also, these uh, this large cryovolcano that I showed you before in the black and white image, let's see, there it is in the center of the screen from a different angle um, with the large pit in the center. Um, one way you could perhaps power something like this is if the ocean is freezing and but it's trapped under an ice shell, the pressure is slowly building up and the excess liquid has to come squirting out. And so it's a way to, to drive a volcanic eruption. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Jim Davies asked, did, did, uh, do any of the craters have a ray system indicating they might be younger? Um, so not so much on Pluto. Uh, I mean, that, this crater is clearly fairly young, but again, the Graben cuts it, not the other way around. No. Mm -hmm. um, but if we go back to Sharon, there are some craters with rays. Um, and I think what that's saying is not that they're younger craters so much as that um, Sharon has had less geology going on recently. And so it just hasn't eroded them away as fast. But for instance, here's one. Yeah. And it's got an interesting pattern where you see the rays are fairly light colored, but then the, the ejecta right close to the crater is dark. Mm -hmm. And that's a little weird. There's several that are like that. Here's another one. Oh, yeah. um, and so that's maybe a hint that uh, the stuff that is flung the farthest, which was done the most violence, uh, somehow or other was turned light or was from closer to the surface and the stuff that didn't get flung as far was done less violence or it was extracted from deeper below the surface or you know something like that. But again, this is some interesting pattern that, that Sharon shows us that hasn't really been seen much elsewhere. Yeah, okay. And, and Eleanor Service would like to know how long are the seasons on Sharon and Pluto? Yeah, so, um, so that's a good question because there's multiple kinds of seasons. Um, on, so first of all, the, the seasons is driven by the orbit around the sun and Pluto's orbit around the sun is two and a half centuries. So a human lifespan is like one season. Um, and, uh, but Pluto has a very high obliquity, which means you know it's tilted over. So its pole is closer to the plane of its orbit than perpendicular to the plane of the orbit like Earth's is. And so then that, that gives you fairly extreme seasons where during one part of the year, and the year is two and a half centuries, remember, one pole is sort of oriented towards the sun and the other pole is in winter darkness. And then, you know, half a Pluto year later, it's the opposite. So mm -hmm. the seasons get quite extreme. 
But then there's orbital perturbations that work on sort of three million year time scale that change whether the pole is oriented towards the sun at perihelion or at aphelion. And Pluto's orbit is a lot more elliptic than the Earth, so that makes a big difference too. And so the seasonal cycles are on these million year time scales as well as on century kind of time scales. And those interact in a complicated way. So what we see today is probably not necessarily representative of what might have been happening a million years ago or 10 million years ago. And uh, so people are busily trying to model that on supercomputers and learn what they can. But uh, yeah, to really get the whole sweep of Pluto's seasonal cycles is going to take longer than humans have existed as a species. <laughs> And you know, this was all, of course, as we said at the start of the show five years ago. And you know, just you were in in Maryland at, at APL. Um, I was here on Mars Hill, and you know, it was just it was it was serious goosebump territory to just stand outside the night before the closest approach. I went down to the overlook, overlooking Flagstaff, and try to imagine that little ship flying in, and particularly in this location. And it was just it was you know it was historic and and. Uh, somewhat emotional to just be part yeah. of that. It must have been equally or, or more electric there at the mission control. Yeah, and and also I think um, for the broader public too, because uh, you and I remember the Voyager encounter with Neptune in 1989, which, like you were saying, is is a, a major trigger for us wanting to go and explore Pluto. Um, let's finish the job. Um, but. Back at that time, it was sort of a dime a dozen. You know, there was the Uranus encounter in 1986, and before that, uh, Saturn, uh, with the Voyager spacecraft marching out through the solar system. And each of those was a, a fabulously exciting time when you got this first up close look at a new planetary system, and just learned all kinds of crazy things. Uh, you know, every single time one of those first flybys happened, you know, oh. like like I was saying, the textbooks have to get rewritten because we've just learned so much more, and younger people had not seen that, you know, that was a while ago. Um, and so this was the first chance for a whole new generation of people to see what planetary exploration uh, in the 1970s and the 1980s was like. And, yeah. uh, and I think it really resonated with people. Um, it, it clearly did. You know, I mean, we had 7,000 visitors here on Mars Hill that one week, which was uh, just Amazing and and yeah, I remember that whole Voyager two grand tour. Of course, I was a teenager. I was we, we both when that started, and yeah, every one of those flybys, particularly the moons, is is it revealed these yeah. this incredibly unexpected diversity of of things on the moons. Um, Nature so, can do that too. Wow. <laughs> um, so Bob Filler would like to know how many institutions were involved in the New Horizons mission and how large was, is the team of scientists, technicians at Alts? Good question. Yeah, it's an excellent question. Um, so, so basically, uh, one way to answer that is to take the budget, which now is a total of something like $800 million, um, and divide that up into salaries, because that's basically what it's getting spent on, is salaries for engineers and scientists. Um, and so that'll get you a number of human years that you could buy for that. And that's effectively what we bought with that money. Mm -hmm. um, but hundreds and hundreds of companies were involved with supplying componentry that went into the rockets and into the instruments. Um, uh, I think the at, at, at its peak, I think the, the head count must have been well into the thousands, um, you know, several thousand. Um, the science team is much smaller. It's maybe you know forty or fifty people with some students and postdocs and and so on, um, and even smaller during the bathtub years. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it's a it's a it's not easy to just give a simple yeah answer, but um, but it's a huge number of people that have been involved at one point or another and people that work for aerospace industry in particular, they sort of march from one project to the next and to the next. And so the people that were working on New Horizons before it was launched have, you know, many of them have retired by now or gone on to 20 other projects since. Um, but the, and the science team has, has lost people and 
and recruited new people. In fact, um, three new, uh, sorry, f five new um, co-investigators were approved by NASA just this week um, to join the team. So there's this continuous renewal going on. Mm -hmm. And a uh, listener would like to know what the media coverage was like during the flyby. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty, pretty crazy. <laughs> So, so we had rehearsed really pretty much everything about this, but one thing that didn't really get rehearsed was the huge scrum of media trying to get attention, trying to get interviews with the science team. And uh, APL did their best to parcel those out. And um, they were basically triaging because it was, uh, it was just too, too many. Um, so they were looking to the biggest outlets, you know, because that would have the biggest impact. And uh, people like, uh, you know, Flagstaff local paper or the NAU station or whatever, they were, they were getting frozen out because they were just a small town. And so, so Kevin was there, Kevin Schindler, um, and he, was, he, he sort of had everybody's contact info in his uh, cell phone and he would just basically lurk and ambush people and, and quick dial uh, somebody who had been m missing out uh, and just do ad hoc interviews. Um, yeah. And, and it, was, it was a blur. It was pretty frantic here on, on Mars Hill too. It was pretty much a steady stream of, of requests, exactly as it was in 2006 after the, the renaming. And, and we were on the phone uh, three days continuously with media all over the world. Um, so um, Claire Gibson would like to know if there are any future ideas for another mission to Pluto. Oh, there are lots of ideas. Um, so uh, um, an orbiter would be great because you could get to see um, a bunch of things. You could see all, you could map the entire surface instead of just one hemisphere. Right. Um, you could also watch how things were changing on, on relatively short-term timescales. You know, right. do, do, are there weather patterns, for instance, that we could see if we were, camped out there for six months or so. Um, can we actually see the glaciers move? That kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, so uh, yeah, I would love to see an orbiter. Um, it's What's not gonna be cheap, but, um, but there are ways to do it that don't require putting a 200 foot rocket en route to Pluto. One would be like a electric propulsion using ion engines. Um, in close to the sun, that's easily powered by solar panels, but that far from the sun, it would have to be powered by a nuclear uh, um, electric uh, source. Um, so that's engineering that uh, would need to be developed. Of course, if you had that, you could also go into orbit around Pluto and then leave orbit around Pluto and go visit the next object over in the Kuiper belt and do that, repeat as needed. So I would love to see something like that and see some of the other objects in the Kuiper belt. There's a lot of exploring to be done out there. Oh. And uh, yeah, sure, Pluto's the largest, but it's only the largest by a smidge. There's a lot of other Pluto-sized objects out there and a lot of smaller objects that you could learn a lot from as well. Well, and speaking of those smaller objects, that was kind of going to be our last topic for the morning before we wrap here is just a quick touch base on, on, on really the next milestone, um, uh, which was, of course, Arakoth, one of the small small things. Yeah, yeah I don't have a picture handy. Um, well, I suppose. Well, we can all kind of picture it, the sort of uh, hourglass. Yeah, the snowman kind of the shape, snowman. the flattened snowman. Um, right. Yeah, okay. so that, that, was, uh, that was actually discovered um, in 2014 shortly before the Pluto flyby, which then allowed us to uh, burn the engines to alter the trajectory ever so slightly um, to target Arakoth in early 2019. Um, we would love to do another flyby. Um, we have not yet discovered an object that we can reach, but there's searches going on right now this summer. Um, uh, and of course, they're using telescopes that are subject to clouds and weather and uh, pandemic uh, uh, operating procedures and and so on. So it's it's we haven't found one yet, but we're looking. Well, and you're so far out now, though. I mean, these things are going to be really hard to find. Yeah, and we're still kind of looking in the Milky Way, although it's not quite as bad as it was uh, right. in 2014. Um, so there's sort of two categories of things we we 
could find. One is one that we could actually get to for another close flyby. That would be fabulous, but the odds are kind of not in our favor. The other though, is that we can discover lots of objects that we can fly close to, but not close enough that we're doing geology and crater counting, but close enough that we would still have better resolution than they would get from the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, and there's a lot of science you could do from that. And that would benefit also from a large sample of objects. And so with a little luck, by the end of this summer, we should have many dozens of objects that can be observed from the spacecraft. Excellent. And there's still plenty of life left in the spacecraft, I think, it, yeah. in terms of the RTG and being able to operate it. Yeah, yeah. So the, the power will keep us plugging along until probably the late 2030s. Um, yeah. The cameras are all working fine. Um, all of the instruments are, are fine. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a very benign environment, actually. The radiation doses are modest. Uh, you know, there's not much changes that far away from the sun. Yep. OK, well, at this point, I think we can ask our viewers for any final questions. There is one that's come in. Basically, what was, I think you may have mentioned this a little earlier, the sort of the total budget on the whole mission. Yeah, so the original budget was, I think, $720 million in fiscal year 2000 or 2001 dollars or something like that. Um, so that would be worth more now just because of inflation. Um, after we discovered Arakoth and we could demonstrate that we could send the spacecraft to it, we put in a proposal for an extra $80 million to, to support that work. And so the grand total ends up being about 800 million in fiscal year, the, the year that we asked for it dollars. No, okay. Um, and Maybe, maybe a slightly more metaphysical question here. Um, ancient Greek history says Pluto is the underworld place. Um, any proof of that? <laughs> well, so there's uh, there is some evidence of. Uh, let me go back to uh, to Pluto. Um, there's some evidence of underground plumbing going on. Um, mm -hmm. I'll just show you one one thing where you see sort of the glacial flow sort of converging on a point, where's the stuff going? You know, is that a bathtub drain there? And <laughs> it's just going underground and then coming out somewhere right. else. It's a weird place, but there's a, and there's a couple other places like that. One that's not so easy to see in this view, but down here, um, there's, there's sort of a low point and a lot of the flow lines seem to be stretching towards that low point. Yeah. And uh, so, Maybe that's another bathtub drain that's not as easy to see in this image, but um, uh, but I would I would argue that it's sort of the opposite. It's the highest point in the solar system. It's you know it's the farthest away from the sun. It's the biggest climb to get there. So it's really more like the summit of the solar system than the than the under <laughs> understory of the solar system. Yeah, well 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 put, and um, certainly a. a beautiful and fascinating world and and i just so pleased to have uh, you on the team and part of the team that that really completed a 90-year circle here at, at lowell from the discovery all the way to through to revealing not only this world but hopefully quite a few others so um it looks like there are no other questions so i'll just say thanks so much for your time for joining us um and I hope the search goes well and we have many other interesting objects to, to reveal at whatever level of detail. So good luck with the rest of the mission and um, we'll see what comes of it. Okay, great. All right, and thanks everybody once again. Thanks for joining us. Um, we'll be back next week with a new episode. Until then, as always, stay safe, stay healthy and um, join us again for all our live streams next week. Till then, goodbye.